are you guys today? Great. Woo, so weak. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all our online friends. I hope you guys are having a great day. And uh, I want us guys to really just proclaim God's goodness today. Today is Palm Sunday, so we're going to celebrate Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all stand up and let's praise God. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. All our presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. God who saves us, worthy of 
God will lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God will lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God will lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Victorious. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We have victory in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus, let me just say something real quick. As we celebrate Palm Sunday, this is the celebration that commemorates Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it's mentioned four times in the four Gospels of the Bible. So right now, let us praise God for sending His Son to earth the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins and our eternal life in Christ through faith. Let's sing Hosanna in the highest. Thank you, God.
stand with the voices and lift up your hands this, this time. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Hallelujah. Three in one. God of glory. Majesty. Praise forever to the King of kings. watching over us, guiding us to have a more and more closer relationship with our Heavenly Father. We give you praise. We give you all the adoration that you deserve. Be blessed and be magnified through our, our worship service. In Jesus, 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 much listening we pray. And all God's people shout amen. 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 may be seated. Amen. Amen. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you all back this morning, especially those of you that were here last night. Was that a wonderful time last night? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was amazing. It was so fun. We had this whole room packed, and if you weren't able to come, then you're going to have to come next year because it was a lot of fun. And we got to hear about how our Lord fulfilled the Passover, our Lord Jesus, and it was prophesied from the very beginning, and it's been fulfilled, and now we get to live in the age of grace. Thank you, Jesus. This morning, uh, I just have a few announcements, and you've heard most of these already, so I'm just going to whip through them, if you don't mind. Good morning online as well. So next week is, yes, good, glad you all know. Next week is Easter Sunday. We'll have our regular services at 8.30 and 10.30, and then we will also have our sunrise service at 6 a.m. That will be beautiful. It will be right outside in the parking lot. Jesse will be there. <laughs> to greet you with a song, right? Maybe. Um, okay, and then coming up on April 11th is our new membership class. We haven't had in a while, so if you've been waiting for that, that will be April 11th right after the second service. You don't need to sign up, just show up. And if you are wondering what 
Living Grace is all about, what Foursquare is all about, that would be a good uh, time for you to come and hear about it. Whether you've decided to become a new member or not, that would be a good, good time to come and make your decision after you get all the information, right? Okay, and then April 16th and 17th, ladies, we have our women's conference, women's essential conference that will be at Cornerstone Christian Church. You can sign up for that online at essentialconference.com. They are also looking for some volunteers. So if you would like to volunteer for that conference, they need some greeters and um, I don't know what else, but they need some volunteers. So that information is also online if you'd like to volunteer for that, if you're going. It's also online if you can't make it, and you can also watch that online. But all that information, again, is essentialconference.com. The uh, April 30th is our men's retreat, and they are still back there taking sign-ups. So, men, we got something for you the, the uh, end of April, so don't miss out on that. I know it is amazing every year. I don't know that personally, but I know that, you know, my husband tells me about it and my son. So uh, you don't want to miss that. Okay. With that... The notes are on the YouVersion app if you would like to follow along. And here's Pastor Richie. Amen. Amen to the video for the men's camp. Applause. That's nice. The table back there, you guys can sign up. Um, don't, if you're thinking, I don't have the money for that, um, would you pray about that? Because God likes to provide things that we don't have for things that he has for us. If you think, I don't have the money for that, you know, that's really not the question. Like, if someone says, are you going to camp, and you go, I don't have the money, that's not the question. <laughs> that's not. The question is, are you supposed to go to the camp? Because God can provide whatever is necessary to provide. Amen to that? Amen. Amen. Men, all right. Hey, listen, we have some postcards out in the front and all around the uh, lobby area for you to invite people. The joy of Easter is our theme for next Sunday. Uh, we want to be celebrating, um, and we believe in everyday Easter, but we'll take the one day that um, is the set-aside day to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And so if you want to invite somebody, uh, some uh, friends, uh, some strangers, even some enemies, give them these cards. Let's get rid of them. They do us no good, 
after Sunday, actually after probably Saturday night. <laughs> um, I'd like to give you a quick update on our capital campaign. Thank you guys first and foremost so much for there are a contingent of people that have been giving for years for our capital campaign, and we, uh, we want to acknowledge you, you, not that we will you know, have you stand up and applaud for you, but we do thank you for what you have done. We do appreciate that. We also um, uh, want to thank all of you who gave and, and are turning in cards today, as well as um, if you haven't got a card, we do have some in the back that you can participate in that so that you can fill that out as well. And um, so the report is... Um, and again, we still have cards coming in. We've, we've uh, already uh, uh, had pledged $30,000, plus or minus. Probably It's plus that, actually. It's a little bit more than that. And so, yay, we're, we're well on our way. Uh, thank you guys for giving. It really means a lot. And um, uh, anything, any amount that you give matters. You know, there's a tendency sometimes to think, well, I don't really have that much to give. That's not... Uh, that's, uh, it's not going to make a difference. Yes, it is. Everything counts. Um, and it also, as we get these pledges in, the sooner the better because it helps us with our Foursquare loan application um, that we are filling out now. And so they'll be able to see that this is what our pledge is as well. And, and that's going to be a big help. Um, uh, we do have, we do encourage you to give those cards to friends and family if you've got anyone that, um, that you're close to or you think that might uh, uh, be looking for some tax donation or looking for something to uh, participate in that we believe is going to be a blessing uh, to us as well as to the community that we're moving to, then uh, give them a card and just have them pray about it and we'll, we'll watch what God does. So thank you guys so much. We're excited about, uh, about that first step that we took in um, uh, of, of many different steps, and so uh, yay and amen to that. Uh, could you all stand up, please? I want to um, pray this morning. Um, our message is entitled, Two Women, a Hammer, a Tent Peg, and a Storm. Two Women, a Hammer, a Tent Peg, and a Storm. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your precious promises. We truly believe what you say in your word. And we believe that your word applies to us today. These aren't random sayings of mere men, but every word of your word is God-breathed, that you literally spoke through uh, the men who wrote the Bible and you spoke through their lives, that they would be an example to us that we could learn from it. And so thank you, God, Thank you that we get to come together and, and partake of your word. We don't take it lightly. Uh, we, we don't um, uh, take it casually. We take it seriously, God, as you, the author of this book, being right here in our midst to teach us and help explain it to us and to cause us to live it out as well. And so we thank you, God for these things in Jesus name and everyone said amen give someone a high five and have a seat if you would uh, you know whatever you're comfortable with uh, you know social dis all social distancing taps are um, yeah, whatever <laughs> you know you guys know hello to our online audience thank you guys for being with us we appreciate it I want to give a thanks to all everyone who helped uh, uh, pull off the Passover Seder last night it was amazing can you give them a hand please whoa it was so much fun, especially when we hid the afikomen, which is that center matzah that we hide, and then the children have to, uh, there's a point in the Seder where the children, you know, they take the middle matzah and they hide it somewhere in the house, and then at some point in the Seder, the children have to find it, and it was utter chaos. I loved it. It was fantastic as the kids were trying to find the mat, the 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 Ofid comb. Anyway, never mind. You had to be here. Appreciate the kids standing on the table, reaching for it, and it was amazing. Ah, oh, hey, um, it all started with a promise. It all started with a promise. God makes a promise to a man and his wife who are barren, unable to have children. And God promises that through them, a great nation 
would be birthed. God miraculously provides a son for Abram uh, and um, Sarah when she's unable to have children to begin this covenant promise that he's made with them. Isaac, the covenant promises flow through him. Isaac marries Rebekah, they're childless. God intervenes, they have a son named Jacob who continues on the promise. God reaffirms the Abrahamic covenant through Jacob. Um, later, his name would be changed to Israel, and Israel would have 12 sons that would, that would see the fulfillment of, of the covenant as each of his sons uh, were a, a particular tribe of the nation of Israel, and the descendants of Jacob were called the children of Israel. And I was thinking about, we don't really, in our culture, we don't really call anyone by that terminology, but the children of Israel. And that's a name that's given specifically to them that is the most common name for the nation of Israel in the Bible. The children of Israel is a, every time we use that word, it's a reminder of the promises of God that one day he would take this couple who is childless and unable to have children and he would birth through them a great nation that would bless the entire earth and one day this nation would birth the Messiah, Jesus. And all of the history of their amazing history, all of the people that have tried to exterminate their entire people group, whether it was Pharaoh or, or whether it was uh, in the book of Esther, a man named uh, Naaman, or whether it was uh, uh, Hitler or Stalin. There's a people group that God has made a promise to, and He fulfilled His purposes in them in birthing the Messiah and then there's more to come because he's not done with them yet. We read of the end times and we read of Israel's incredible involvement in all of that. God's promises are true. So every time you think of the children of Israel, I want you to think about the promises of God fulfilled. But you know what? We too are his children. We are the children of God. Human beings um, are God's children creation, and they are precious in His sight, but not all humans are His children. Because the children of God, it says in 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. John 1, 12 says, But to as many as did receive, and the Amplified Bible says, and welcome Him, uh, uh, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God, that is, to those who believe and adhere to and trust in and rely on Him. A child of God is not just a particular nation or a particular people group. Now it's those people who are followers of Jesus Christ and who believe in Him, and therefore I am a child of God. And every time I, I, I think of the children of Israel, I want to think about God's faithfulness, but you know what? I want to also think about God's faithfulness in my life because I'm a child of God as well. Can you say amen to that? Amen. It's a constant reminder. So Ehud, everybody say Ehud. Ehud, Ehud the judge is dead. We're in Judges chapter 4. They have had a season of peace in the land and the cycle that they've been struggling with and we've been reading about continues. Israel once again does evil in the sight of the Lord and once again the sovereign God raises up an enemy to bring correction and his people plunge from serenity to sin and then to slavery. It's a constant cycle that these people are, are stuck in. And, and one of the things that it constantly reminds me is the sovereignty of God. And that God is able to raise up a nation and he's able to take down a nation. He's able to raise up a leader and take down a leader. And in the scope of world history, someone once said that history is really his story. And somehow, in the midst of all the craziness and the evil and the good and the bad and the ugly, God is still sovereign. 
And the same God who in Judges chapter 4 raises up a nation or a leader and takes another nation or leader down is the same God who is sovereign over the affairs of the world today. I am all for saving the planet. Is that the right terminology? I'm all for recycling. I'm all for being a good... Here's a better definition being a good steward of our planet. But I also know that nothing is happening into this world until God says so. No matter what we do or don't do. Now, we have to be good stewards, and I think Christians should lead the way with things like that. I also think it shouldn't become a God in our lives. Like, just because you drive an electric car, you're better than the rest of us. No, you might be cooler. Let's see who makes it to L.A. first. No, I'm just kidding. I want an electric car, but that's just, <laughs> catch you in Barstow, baby. You know, anyway. Hey, call me when you charge up. No, I'm kidding. I think it's awesome. I wish I had a hybrid or something. That, my next car is going to be a hybrid. Lord willing, it will be. <laughs> if I gotta go, if I gotta go across the nation, though, I'm gassing up, baby. Anyway, no, I'm not joking. <laughs> okay, don't be offended. Don't be mad at me. Don't write me a letter. Talk to me. Talk to me. I'm here. I'm here. Ah, Ehud is dead. God is sovereign. Job being the king of Canaan is the king of Canaan, and Sisera is his commander. And God raises them up. They have 900 chariots of iron. These are the military tanks of the day. If you have chariots and your adversary doesn't, you win. They have one or two horses. They have knives that stick out of the wheels that create all kinds of carnage on the battlefield. It is, it, is, it is 900 chariots of iron. Uh, it's no contest. They are easily subjugating and harshly oppressing the children of Israel and have done so for 20 years. Joshua chapter 11 tells us that Joshua defeated a king by that same name years earlier and burned the city of Hazor. Somehow the city has been rebuilt. And it reminds me that obedience today can eliminate tomorrow's battles. Obedience today can eliminate tomorrow's battles because I've been in enough battles today because of things that I didn't do beforehand. Can you say, man, am I making sense? Because sometimes, you know, first service was like all totally getting it. And I know you guys are spiritual and y'all would be like, we don't even know what he's talking about. They got it. You know, they're pointing at each other and they're kind of a rough crowd at first service. So you guys are much more civilized, and holy, probably have an electric car, never diesel. I don't know. I don't know. Obedience today eliminates tomorrow's battles because I have uh, had enough regret in my life. And oh, how I wish I could go back. Don't you wish you could go back? You cannot go back. When I was a youth minister, I, 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 I cried. I, 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 everything within me, I, I tried to tell young people, Listen, don't go there. You will regret it. It's not what you think it is. Um, obedience today eliminates tomorrow's battles and secures tomorrow's blessings. They did not push the people out of the land, therefore they're battling them now. So, there's a cycle, as we've been talking about, of, of, of sin 
um, and slavery. And then after years, supplication where they cry out to God. God sends a savior, a deliverer, and then there's serenity or peace. And then they go back to sin. And I'm like, man, what is their problem? How, how, how can they not have this figured out? They, they're go, they worship idols. You stray from God. There's a price to pay. It's going to happen. And it's like, you have the history. It happens over and over again. What is your problem? And then I look in the mirror, and I think, what is your problem? How can you not figure this out? You knew this was, oh, my goodness. And I, and I, and I wrestle in my own life. I think about these people, and I think, are they forgetting to pass on the legacy to the next generation? I, I have to tell you, we, we, we will do whatever we can do short of sin to reach the next generation. I've got some council members here, and I'm telling you, we will empty the bank to reach children, young people. We will empty the bank. I would rather have zero money in my bank account and have a room full of kids because we've spent all this money to reach them. That was from a council. Was that you, Kim, council member? Just making sure. I'm listening. I'm, notice I'm looking over here because she's on the council going, okay, that's going to cost us if we subtract 22. Ooh. <laughs> Praise God for our council. They hold me accountable. No, you can't spend that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, hear me? 85% of people come to Christ before their 18th birthday. 85%. I don't know if they weren't passing on the faith to the next generation. I don't know if it was just a temptation of living in the land they were living in over the long haul. It's tough to live in Canaan in the midst of idolatry and immorality. It's hard. It's hard to live in Las Vegas in the midst of immorality and idolatry. It's hard. But guess what? Whatever culture and time we live in, God provides everything necessary for his people to flourish and not flounder if we would trust in him. Did they get comfortable? Did they get complacent? When they cried out to God in supplication, were they sorry or did they just want the slavery to end? Why wasn't God their first option? I don't know, but I know this. Daily devotion to the Lord is like the rails that keep us on track with the Lord. Daily devotion is like, like a train on tracks. It keeps me spiritually in the right direction. And it is so hard for me. I get so busy. I'm running here and there, doing this and that, doing the work of the Lord. But if I'm not spending time with the Lord, it, dim it diminishes my ability to work for the Lord. And it's hard for me. I get distracted way too easily. And I'm saying that that quiet time must be my priority. It must be. Because daily devotion to the Lord are like the rails that keep me on track. And because I'm going to the Lord daily, I'm less likely to stray slowly. Whatever the case for these people, God, who knows the motive of the heart, responds to their cry. <laughs> One of the things the book of Judges shows us is the, the foolishness of depending on your own self to follow God and not trusting and leaning on Him. 
And it also shows us the grace of God to reach out to his people at the faintest cry. Whatever their motive is, I don't know. God knows. They cried out to God. He responds. Because today, God responds to his people when they cry out to him. He responds. We may not always see it, but he responds because he loves his people and it all started with a promise. And God keeps his promises. Can you say amen to that? Amen. After 20 years, Israel cries out to the Lord in supplication. And look what happens. It says in verse 4, Now Deborah, everybody say Deborah. Yeah. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel, the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Then she, uh, then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor? Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. That's a question that she asked him. And she starts by saying, has not the Lord God commanded Israel, go, deploy. Okay, time out for just a minute. God raises up a woman. We'll be speaking to this half of the crowd from this point on. <laughs> he raises up a woman to lead his people as a judge and a prophetess. So she's the prime minister of Israel and she's a prophetess. That's a jolly good mix right there. But she's a woman. I mean, seriously, in a male dominated society where women, for the most part, had no rights. People think that Christianity has been oppressive. The Bible is oppressive to women. Are you joking? Have you really read how the Bible elevates womanhood? How the Bible sets women free to be everything that God has created them to be? I mean, how, the, how the, even in the law of God, it talks about the care and concern on how to treat wives and women, and, and, and even in the New Testament, how uh, it elevates womanhood. It is a lie to say that Christianity beats down women and suppresses women. No, it elevates women to all that God has created them to be. The people in this culture wanted strong male leadership. God, in his sovereignty, picked a woman to lead them. And all the other nations are going, what? What? Let me get this straight. They got a woman leading them? Oh, no. Yes. Deborah earned the people's respect as a judge. Some might consider it unexpected that God would raise up a woman to lead his people. How many of you would agree that God does the unexpected thing all the time? He reserves the right to do that. And this is an act of grace. Man looks at the outside, God looks at the heart, and he can use whomever he wants to, whenever he wants to, to accomplish whatever he wants to for his glory. He's not bound by culture or our idiosyncrasies or what we believe should be done in this case or this situation. God can use whomever he wants to use. She's a prophetess. And we read about other prophetesses in the Bible. Miriam, Exodus 15, Huldah, 2 Kings 22, Noadia, Nehemiah 6, 4, Anna, Luke chapter 2, verse 36, Philip's four, dollar, four daughters, Acts chapter 21, verse 8 and 9. I, 
I just, I just I wrote this down. I thank God for the gifted women in our church who are mightily used of God to speak prophetically into situations. No, I thank God for them. I have seen women speak forth into situations prophetically that have literally saved lives and changed the trajectory of people in their lives. There are times when there are women in our church who have spoken prophetically where I have said, that is the voice of the Lord right there speaking. And I know that it is. It's awesome. Thank God for the gifts and talents that He's given women. You're not second class. You're not less than. You stand up and you operate in the gifts and callings of the Lord. Be biblical. There's a lot of prophecy out there that is not from God. And so you have to be discerning. There are people who are speaking prophetically about things that do not happen. One of the ways that you know that someone is speaking prophetically is it is in line with the Word of God. If it's not in line with the Word of God, I don't care what they say. Secondly, if what they prophesy or predict doesn't come to pass, they have spoken presumptuously. Now, no one's batting a thousand here. No one's perfect in any of the gifts. That doesn't make you a false prophet necessarily unless you continue to prophesy things that don't happen. But we have to be discerning in our spiritual climate because sometimes people run to and fro to hear the latest prophetic word and they haven't got a word from the Lord themselves. What is God saying to you in this? What does God's word say? So there's a balance there. But I thank God for the prophetic movement and the accuracy and the ability for God to speak things forth that are life-changing and that draw people to Jesus. The plan, verse 6, she says, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Barak, which means lightning, was to deploy these troops. He was to lead the troops. Here are the specifics, because prophecy is always specific. If it's general, let's say if the Lord, I'm going to bless the whole world. Eh, time out, bro. You got to give me something better than that, okay? Can we just kind of be specific here? <laughs> All right. You know, it's specific. Take these 10,000 men, the sons of Naphtali and Zebulun, then God will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, into a trap with the multitude of chariots at the river Kishon. God will deliver them into your hand. What I see here is prophecy working in hand with wisdom because she speaks prophetically and says, God's going to deliver this army into your hand. And then she gives him specific words on how to do this. Here's how many people you take with you. Here's where you go. Here's what you do. Here's what God's going to do. And God gets the glory and gets the victory. When God wants to bring glory to himself through his people, he always has a plan. Our job, should we choose to accept it, is to figure out what his plan is. Verse 8 says, And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. Remember that song, where you go, I'll go, where you stay, I'll stay? Well, that's not where this comes from. <laughs> if you will go with me, then I will go with you. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh, and Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. He went up with 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went up with him. What's up with Barak? Is he unbelieving? He has the word of the Lord to go. And he's like, all right, I'll go, but I'm not going without you. Was it cowardly? Did he need the support? Did he 
refused to go without the, the leader of the nation who was also prophetic? We don't know, but perhaps his trust was not in the hands of God. But maybe his trust was in Deborah. I don't know, but I do know this. It's easier to trust someone you can see rather than the unseen God. It's easier to trust someone you can see rather than the unseen God. I forget all the time that the things that are unseen are more real than the things that I see. As a follower of Christ, there's an entire dimension of the unseen that my eyes have been opened to that I didn't know exist. Some folks don't believe, believe basically, if I can't see it, I don't believe it. I had a, an old boss one time who said, if it can't be proven mathematically, it doesn't exist. How do you prove thought? I can't see it. How do you prove love? Certainly, this doesn't fit into a formula. But it is easier for us to believe in things we can see. And yet the Lord is constantly trying to bring me into a realm where I believe in things that I cannot see. Jesus has a conversation with a centurion who has a servant who's sick. And he says, will you come and heal him? And Jesus says, I will come. In Matthew 8, verse uh, verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but, but speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority and I tell someone uh, to, to, to do this and they do that. I say, come and they come. Uh, just speak the word. This man had enough faith to believe that Jesus was who he said he was and says, you can be over there, Jesus, and, and you don't even know my servant. You, don't even, you can't even see my servant, at least with my eyes, but if you speak the word, what you say will be done to my servant. Just speak the word. I'm not even worthy for you to come into my home. And Jesus marvels and says to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I've not found such great faith, not even in Israel. In all of Israel. And there's the disciples. They're like, hey, what about us? They're like, man, this man's faith is remarkable. And he speaks forth the word. And his servant gets healed. What was Deborah going to do in battle? Why did he ask her to go? Is she going to lead the charge on a horse? Take out a couple chariots, stand in the back and shoot an arrow? No, no. The men were going to go and fight. It was a bloody, nasty, gory thing. But he says, I won't go without you. She's not a military leader. She's not a warrior. But there was something about the Spirit of God flowing through her that he said, you've got to go with us. She's not fighting the battle, but her presence meant a lot. And so she goes. And no doubt she inspired them. Here's the setup. Hebner, the Kenite, Jael's husband, hears word that the children of Israel are on the march. So he tells Sisera that Barak has gone up to Mount Tabor. Verse 12 says, So Sisera gathered, verse 13 rather, So Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from that place to the river Kishon. So here's the scene, Mount Tabor, the children of Israel, 10,000. There's actually more than that, but we'll get to that. And then here's this massive army with, with the chariots, 900 of iron. There's no turning back now because you've got to come down the mountain to go any place. It's all in. They're trapped. And if God doesn't show up, it's going to be a disaster. Verse 14, then Deborah said to Barak, and maybe this is why he asked her to come. 
up. <laughs> you love it? She's such a leader. Deborah, up. Get up. This is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord God gone out before you? So Barak went down, everybody say down, from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all, and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as that place, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. So Barak goes down the mountain, which puts his army at a great disadvantage. Because as long as he's in the mountain, the chariots can't go scale the mountain. But when he's down in the valley, then, they're, then all the odds are stacked against the enemy. Has not the Lord commanded, Deborah says? And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army. The Lord did that. And they destroyed everyone. Chapter 15 tells us that there were volunteers from other tribes of Israel that joined in. So at some point after the initial battle, their, their army swelled to 40,000. What changed? What changed? We say this every week. There's a group of people who were in bondage, who were enslaved, who can't lift up their hand against the enemy at all. God raises up a judge who happens to be unexpectedly a woman and she, she inspires the people and all of a sudden these very same people that were hiding are now charging into battle. What changed was what God was doing and what God had said. She says, has not the Lord delivered Sisera into your hands? And somehow that step of faith galvanized another 30,000 soldiers to the fight. And then we see the X factor. And the X factor is the thing that you really can't calculate. Like sometimes God does something that's like, wasn't really expecting that, but because God did that, now I get it. Right? You ever have that happen in your life? Well, it happens. Chapter 5, verse 4, and verse 20 through 22 tells us the Lord sent a fierce rainstorm that would swell the banks of the Kidron River, cause it to overflow and make the valley a muddy mess, making it, what, impossible to utilize chariots. I promise you this king did not take 900 chariots to the battlefield during the rainy season. That's why you didn't fight when the rains come. Hey, man, I'll see you in the spring. Yeah, watch what happens. Let's just go now because it's starting to rain. Oh, no. Oh, no. It was the dry season, and God brought an avalanche of rain, and those chariots are turning over, and they're flipping over, and they're useless in the floods. And then it says... Along with the storm and the flood, God sent confusion in the minds of the enemy. Chapter 4, verse 15 says that he routed them. Here's what the word routed means. He confused and threw them into panic. So you have this massive army with all of this artillery and God supernaturally brings a storm and over floods the banks and they're thrown into a panic. Nobody saw that one coming. Remember the Canaanite god Baal? Baal or Baal is the god of what? Weather. So what was God doing? Once again, taking dead aim at these false gods and showing who the one true God really is. Psalm 20 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. I wrote this down. There are times in every believer's life when the Lord sets up circumstances where you must trust Him and Him alone.
And he does it to draw us near to him and to allow our story to be a testimony to others. Daily devotion to the Lord prepares me for those times. Because when those times come, I must lean on Him with everything I've got. So I want to be leaning into Him on a daily basis. Well, it's not over yet. Two women, a hammer, a tent peg, and a storm. Here's the story of another woman. <laughs> Jael, J.L., Heber's wife. So the Canaanite captain, Sisera, is running for his life. I think it's hilarious. The men are fighting the battle. Obviously, they're not going to win. And being the military leader that he is, he takes off in the other direction. He's running for his life. Providentially, he ends up at the tent of Heber. Heber and his people were friendly toward Jabin. So it seems a logical place for him to hide. So he is in this, he is, he, uh, uh, Heber's wife invites him into her tent for refuge. Because no one, culturally, you did not go into the tent of a Men's tents and women's tents were separate. And no one but her husband would go in there, so no one would think of finding him there. Sisera tells her to lie if anyone asked if he's in there. She must have concluded that he was fleeing from the enemy. It turns out that her people were Jewish people. She must have concluded that. Obviously, someone's chasing him. What neither of them knew was that God said a woman was going to take his life in chapter 4, verse 9. They didn't know that, but God did. Once again, God sovereignly arranging everything to turn out exactly the way that he wants it to. So she takes a tent peg and a hammer she covers him up, gives him something, some milk. You know, it's a nice little warm milk. He goes to sleep. She covers him up. She takes a tent peg and a hammer, and she permanently fastens his head to the ground. Is that okay? Can I say, yeah? Yeah. See, the Bible doesn't hide these details. It's a time of war. It's ugly. She assassinates him. She violated every custom of the day. She invited him into her tent. No. She provided hospitality. She violated a treaty between her, her husband and him. She killed a defenseless man under her protection. Was she just in what she did? Was she, was she justifiable in what she did? Chapter 5, verse 24, Deborah is singing a song about Jael, and she says, most blessed among, among women is Jael. The wife of Heber the Kenite, may she be blessed above all women who live in tents. She prays a blessing upon this woman. Did we mention that the Jews were under very harsh subjugation to these people? Very harsh. Did we mention that it was God's plan to deliver his nation? Chapter 5, verse 30 tells us that, that had they lost the battle, the Jewish woman would have been captured. And no doubt raped. Whether what she did was justified or not, I will leave for you to determine. But either way, God allowed it to bring victory to his people. God can make even the evil of man serve his purposes. 
Psalm 76.10 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. One um, commentator, Poole, put it this way. He said, She was encouraged to do it partly by observing that the heavens and all the elements conspired against him, as against one devoted to destruction, partly by the fair opportunity which God's providence put into her hands, and principally by the secret instinct of God inciting her to it and assuring her of success in it. So he loses his life at the hands of a woman which was prophesied by Deborah that it would happen. Well, it says in verse 23, So on that day God subdued Jabin king of Canaan in the presence of the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin king of Canaan until they had destroyed Jabin king of Canaan. Israel wins the battle. And yet there's still a war going on, a great war, and there's more to come. See, you and I as followers of Christ are in a battle. Jesus has won the war. We celebrate that every day, and in particular on Easter, we celebrate his victory for us, secured for us, that we could walk in victory. But guess what? The war is won, but the battle is not over. So we still fight. We fight sin and selfishness and Satan. And the battle rages on because we know there's more to come. But we fight from a place of victory, not for victory. I wrote this down in conclusion. God often uses the most unlikely people in the most unconventional ways to accomplish the most amazing feats that only He can do all for His glory. Are there any unlikely people in this place? I know there are. I know some of you were voted most unlikely to be a Christian in your high school yearbook. It all begins with a promise. And there's a promise, or rather a command that God has given us. Matthew 28, 18. Go, therefore, into all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Making disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Her command to the people was go. That's Jesus' command to us today. By the way, one last thing in closing. In Hebrews, we call that chapter 11, the Hebrews Hall of, uh, the Faith Hall of Fame. Because there's some names that are mentioned that did some pretty amazing exploits. It says this. The writer to the Hebrew says, And what more shall I say? For the time would not would the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. These are people that we'll read about further on in the book of Judges. But he mentions Barak. Remember Barak, the one who said, I'm not going unless you go with me. Uh-uh. Okay, I'll, okay. I'll lead them in the battle, but you got to (laughs) come. Well, whatever the case was, he made it into a very exclusive place. He operated in faith, and he led the nation to that place of serenity. Hey, God wants to use his people for some pretty amazing things. I guess the only question is, is am I willing? Am I willing? Am I willing to go? Am I willing to speak? Am I willing to share? Am I willing to suffer? Am I willing to be used by Him? May our eyes be fixed on Him. And I pray that this Easter that we would celebrate like we've never celebrated before. Let's all stand, shall we? God, thanking You for Your grace and for Your mercy. Thanking You for what You're doing in the lives of people. I know there are many here that could testify to Your goodness and Your greatness. And the, and the amazing things that you are doing in spite of some very difficult times and circumstances. God, I, I thank you for your sovereignty. Help me to always remember that you are sovereign. 
and that you are supernaturally working things out behind the scenes. Lord, help me to believe that there are sometimes things that are unseen that are more real than the things that I do see. And I don't always know what you're up to because you have a tendency to do things in unexpected ways. But I know this much. I'm your child. We are your children. And we can expect your love and your grace and your mercy no matter what. So, Father, would you pour it out upon us and would you cause us to be grace dispensers today? In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord, bless you guys. Have a great week in the Lord. Uh, I want to remind you to take some of these postcards that we sent out to a large group of people, but... <laughs> If you would like to invite someone to our Easter celebration, grab some of these, please. They're not going to do us any good on Saturday. <laughs> they need to be in your hands given out.